Hello, I'm Mr. Dove, and this is Bio Lessons to Go, Alternate Patterns of Inheritance. When Mendel studied pea plants, he was able to determine the basic patterns of inheritance through meticulous study. But in reality, inheritance patterns go way beyond what Mendel could ever have observed by just studying pea plants. Life is perhaps a little more complex than simple pea plants. There are many different alternate patterns of inheritance that we've discovered since then. Some include incomplete dominance, multiple alleles, polygenic inheritance, and the role that the environment plays in determining genetic traits. Today we're going to take a look at a few of these um, to get a better understanding of inheritance patterns. The first one that we'll look at is incomplete dominance. In cases of incomplete dominance, one allele is not completely dominant over the other, and you end up getting sort of a mix of traits in the heterozygote individual. So the dominance is incomplete. One allele doesn't completely dominate the other. One place where we see this is in horses. Here we've got um, this br deep brown color and a cream color. So pure brown with pure cream, when they come together, it yields what we call palomino. And so where the brown is not completely dominating the cream and some of the cream is kind of showing through. If um, Mendel had observed this, uh, he might not have been able to disprove the idea of blending theory because it looks like things are blending but they're not. Let's explain how blending is not happening here using uh, a Punnett square and a flower called a snapdragon. Red snapdragons are pure bred for the red trait, they're homozygous. White snapdragons are also pure bred, they're homozygous recessive for that trait. When red snapdragons are bred with white snapdragons all of the offspring are going to be heterozygous but because of incomplete dominance they all appear pink so when we look at that we think that the alleles the, the traits must be blending but incomplete dominance does not support blending theory because the white gene, the white allele, does not blend with the red one because the red and white traits can come back in the second generation. Let me show you. When you cross your pink snapdragon with another pink snapdragon, we'll get a homozygous dominant individual, two heterozygous individuals, and one homozygous recessive. When you only have red alleles, you're going to appear red. If you have red and white alleles, then you're going to be pink. And if you have only white alleles, then you're going to be white. And so the white trait comes back, and the red trait came back. The alleles didn't blend at all. Now, when dealing with incomplete dominance, since one trait really isn't dominant over the other, using capital and lowercase letters could be confusing. So when dominance is not complete, capital letters are oftentimes not used. Instead, we use all capital letters and uh, indicate the difference in the alleles with a superscript. For example, here we have some blue Andalusian chickens. Um, they're blue because they have both a black allele and a white allele. So we're using capital letters, but we're showing that they are for the same trait through our superscript. So here's another uh, blue Andalusian. And when they mate, we're going to get a homozygous black, two blues, and one homozygous white. So we'll get our black Andalusian, our blues, and then our white. Another alternate pattern of inheritance is multiple alleles. 
In cases of multiple alleles, a trait is going to have more than just the two alleles coding for it. So instead of having perhaps an, a dominant and a recessive, we're going to have more than two. What this does, this results in the possibility of more than three different phenotypes um, for that given trait. Let's look at a couple of examples. One example, we have the coat color for bunny rabbits. Coat color is controlled by four alleles. We represent those alleles with the letter C with various superscripts. We have the dark gray allele, which is dominant over the chinchilla allele. Chinchilla is dominant over Himalaya, which is dominant over albino. Depending upon the combination you receive, you're still only receiving two, one from the mom and one from the dad, you're going to have a different coat color. You'll be dark gray, chinchilla, light gray, Himalayan, or albino. A great example of multiple alleles in humans is our blood type. There are three alleles for the gene that determines blood type, A alleles, B alleles, and O alleles. A alleles are written with a capital I superscript A, B alleles are written with a capital I superscript B, and O alleles are written with a lowercase i. The reason for this is so that we can show that A and B are both dominant over O. Depending upon the combination of alleles that you receive, that's going to determine your blood type. If you only receive recessive alleles, then you're going to have O blood type. There are two ways to have the A blood type. You can be homozygous for the A trait, only having A alleles, or you can be heterozygous for the A trait, having both A alleles and O alleles. There's two ways to be B. You can be homozygous B, only having B alleles, or you can be heterozygous B, one B allele and one O allele. To have AB blood, that means you have both an A allele and a B allele, both dominant alleles. It's kind of strange. Since A and B are both dominant, they express themselves equally at the same time. This is an example of another form of inheritance called codominance, where both the A and the B phenotype are expressed. So they're expressed together. So the A allele and the B allele are dominant, but they're going to be dominant together. They're co-dominant. So how will we do a Punnett square to be able to predict the possible outcomes of a cross when dealing with blood types? Well, fortunately, multiple allele Punnett squares are performed the same way any other trait is. We follow our three steps. We'll be ensured success. The first step of any good Punnett square is we need to figure out what are the genes of the parents involved in the cross. So in this case, we have a woman who's heterozygous for type A blood and a man who is heterozygous for type B blood that are expecting children. So what would be the possible um, outcomes of this cross? So our female is heterozygous for type A. That means she has an A allele and an O allele. The father is heterozygous for B, which means he has a B allele and an O allele. We separate the alleles and we place them in the Punnett square. And then we determine the outcomes by combining those alleles and simulating that fertilization event. So the first offspring has an A allele and a B allele, which means they're going to have AB blood. The next offspring has a B allele and an O allele, which means they have B blood. The next offspring would have an A allele and an O allele, which means they would have an A allele. And the last possible offspring would have two O alleles, which means they'd have O blood type. So in terms of chances, we would have a 25% chance of AB blood type, a 25% chance of having B blood, 25% chance of having A, or even 25% chance of O blood type. So these parents have the chances of having children of any blood type. Another form of alternate pattern of inheritance would be polygenic inheritance. 
In polygenic inheritance, there is more than a single pair of genes that is, uh, that is affecting a characteristic. So you have poly, many, many genes controlling a single trait. In the case of eye color, there are at least two pairs of alleles that are coding for a particular trait. And depending upon the combination that you receive, that's going to give you a different eye color. The last element that we'll talk about today that leads to an alternate pattern of inheritance is the environment. The environment influences our traits and the expression of our genes. For example, these two mice are actually genetically identical. If we were to look at their DNA, their DNA would be the same. The only difference is the nutrition that the mother received during pregnancy. The brown mouse's mother had a much more nutritious diet, rich in folic acid, and those prenatal uh, nutrients helped with the expression of the genes in the offspring, leading to a healthier baby. Whereas, unfortunately, the regular diet that the yellow mouse mother received led to the expression of his genes, which unfortunately are less healthy. Similarly, the nutrition received in the developing offspring of bees can change the expression of genes. When certain uh, babies, certain larvae, receive an enzyme-rich mixture called royal jelly, it leads to the expression of genes such that they become queen bees. So the queen bee is genetically identical to her workers. The only difference was the nutrition she received while she was developing changed the expression of her genes. The environment can still influence us even after we're born. Temperature can change the sex of reptiles. It can change the color of, of the fur of certain mammals. Depending upon what we eat or how we exercise, it changes um, our fitness levels. It can influence our intellect. Um, it can determine the maximum height we can achieve. If you had two twins, one was receiving a highly nutritious uh, diet and uh, was exercising regularly, while the other, um, less nutritious and a uh, less active lifestyle, um, over time, perhaps we would see that the more uh, the one receiving the higher nutrition and the better activity would have grown taller and perhaps achieved higher things intellectually than their twin brother. The discovery of how the environment influences our genes and how genes are expressed has led to the development of a brand new branch of genetics called epigenetics. So we can see that genetics is much more complex than Mendel could have even imagined. That simple dominance is not the only way that we get um, our traits expressed. Um, the few that we've talked about today are exciting ways that our genes can be expressed, but there are even more that we don't have time to talk about. So hopefully this has um, increased your interest in genetics and you've learned a couple new things about how traits are expressed.